So we're going to uh, now paint some rocks in the foreground. And I decided, I did this the first time, this is my first one I did of it, and I decided that I didn't like this rock being as green as it looks. So um, on one of my other ones, um, I pushed it so that it's browner. And I'll show it there, and then I'll show you guys. So you can see how how green this one looks. And that is sort of what is in the photo, is that it's very green and some orange on it. So the rock probably has some moss and, and some stuff on there that's making it green, but I just didn't care for that down there. So I went with some other colors. And I ended up using, let's see if I have it on here. I don't have it on that one. So I am going to use my um, ultramarine and burnt sienna and I will also have out my warm red just so that I can add a little bit of that if I want it, which I probably will. This. Oh. this is a hazard because I really need to have my photo over here so I'm not dripping water across it, but we shall see. Okay, so um, I started ultramarine deep. I'm gonna reach over into my ultramarine though. This. I need to put some actual uh, new paint in here because this has some edges to it that I can't quite get them to break down <laughs> and now it's yeah. loose in my palette. So I, I used so much of it recently that it's just it needs to be refilled. There it goes. At least it's holding on to my palette. Now if you ever have um, loose paint in your palette like this one's loose if you take a little bit of water and just squirt it under there and then usually just kind of giving it a little some some pressure it releases some of that pigment and can kind of get them to stick a little better yeah it doesn't always stay completely but at least it helps okay so i'm getting out quite a bit and i want a lot of pigment because these rocks up front are dark there are some lighter areas in them, and I am going to use a little bit of water on um, the upper edge on this one so that I can uh, have a lighter area in that rock. Okay, and then I'll grab my warm red, which is the Parole Scarlet. As I've said in the past, it could be vermilion or um, cadmium red, cadmium red hue they're not really making cat bread anymore. And I won't need a lot of that. Um, I tend to get more out than I might need because this is very strong. So if you go to use cat red in anything, generally you just need a little bit of it because it's really strong pigment. Not cat red, parole scarlet or cat red. I'm not so sure about vermilion because I don't have it on my palette, but it might be the same way that you don't need a lot of it. And I will get out more burnt sienna. You could also use burnt umber. Um, trying to think if there's another brown. Probably those burnt sienna, burnt umber. Okay. And uh, my brush now has a lot of burnt sienna on it, and so I'm just going to get a little bit. Um, bring it over to the blue on the edge because that way now I have kind of a um, blue-brown mix and I can adjust it from there. And then I will grab a brush to use for clear water. And I'm going to place this on the top edge of the rock but I'm not going to touch right next to the edge because I want that um, that edge that's next to the water to be dark enough that it feels like the rock is in front of the water and that it's got some presence to it. So I'm staying back from the edge just a little bit so that my darker paint when I put it on will be behind that. Okay. And just trying to clean that off a little bit and dry in the back just a touch because uh, this brush is big and it holds a lot of paint and water. 
even go a little cooler back there. Kind of make sure my head's not in the way. And then bringing it in. And it's really flowing right now, so I will probably have to go back and lift some of that light area. I'm, I'm ignoring this top line right now because it is moving so much. It's so wet right now. If you start to paint and it's moving a lot, then you might want to pause and let it um, lose some of that uh, shine or dry your brush a little bit more so that it will not move as much for you. And I think that's dry enough. I'm gonna dry the back edge again. So I'm taking some of the water out and then I can go back behind there with my paint. And then I'll bring it down. So there's a little variety happening in here. I don't want it so dark, so um, flat black, whoops, there's a hair, that uh, it looks like a hole. So you need to, um, you want it to be dark, but you want it to have um, some color changes maybe, some value changes here and there. And then as it comes down to the bottom edge, I'm making it a little cooler because this side would be more in shadow and um, it is possibly wet. And so usually that makes the, the rock feel uh, wet or cooler when it's um, a bluer, cooler feel to it. All right, so I've got that one on, and now I can go do this one, and I'm just going to use the same colors. Actually, at the top of this, there's a little bit of some warm, so I'm going to come back from the upper edge just a little bit. And before that dries, I'm going in with my same darker values. And before this dries up here, I'm going to come back in with a little bit of my warm red because So there's just a little edge at the top up there, and I'm cleaning my brush just a little bit because it had a lot of blue in it. And um, I'm going to actually go back and pick up some of that kind of warm brown and then get my red because I don't want my red to read as um, too vibrant. So I'm neutralizing it just a little bit before I went and got the red. Uh, and I think that's pretty good right in there. Okay, so now I have uh, those two darker rocks in and that starts to give me the values and the, um, you know, the composition to decide do I need to do anything else before I would remove the masking fluid. And the one thing that I'm going to do, I like that lighter area right there. There was a lighter area up in there and it's just slightly damp. And I've dried my brush so that it's just a little damp. And I'm going to go in there and see if I can just pull up just a little, a little bit more um, light on the top edge of that rock. And you could do the same in here if you felt like, I don't really see it on that other side, but just to uh, make it feel like it's got a little bit of light up in there compared to down below, you could lift just a touch if you want to. Um, and then I think from there it's letting it dry. Now I made this dark enough that if I try to go put some shadows over it later, they're going to have to go quite a bit darker. So um, it's kind of that back and forth between, you know, do you need it darker or not? And these shadows that are on that rock, they help give it form because they're, they're going sort of, um, if you do them with a little bit of a curve to them at the top edge, they help make the rock look rounded. So it's um, kind of nice to have them in there, but if they're not there, it's one of those things that no one's gonna see the photo, no one's going to miss that because there's, we're not seeing any trees over here. So we don't know that there might, or, or should be shadow on that rock. So um, right now, I think it's good and I'm going to leave it like that. And I will uh, come around and see if you guys need anything because this has to dry. I'll look at it a few minutes and then decide, do I need to do anything else? And then I'll probably remove the masking fluid next. So I'll come around and see if you guys need anything. Turn this on. Um, I have mine to the point where I feel like I've got enough darks in there. The water, um, I could maybe go back and do some part of it if I want to, but 
I think it's, uh, for me, it's um, to the stage where I'm okay with taking the mask off. I would not suggest that you take your masking fluid off until you feel like you've got the water and the rocks where you want them for this painting because you've got lots of little dots in there and then you've got some places that can be harder to paint around. So sometimes that means like the painting I'm doing at home right now, you have to leave the mask on until you've pretty much got everything exactly where you want it. And so that might be until the end of the painting, which unfortunately for this painting has been since April or May since I started it and then a lot of things got in the way. So you need to be careful when you're using masking fluid on a painting if you're not able to get it done um, within generally three to four months and that's not being in a hot room, not being in a hot car, then um, it should be okay. Um, but mine is pushing it a lot. And I, when I was going to take the mask off of that one, there were a couple places where it was a little hard to get it to remove. And I have had paintings in the past where I've left it way too long and it just stuck to the painting, so it won't come off. Um, and then this is a really weird thing, and I show my classes because for me, it's a way that I can clean my mask off of my tools. It is the masking fluid that comes off my paintings. So I just start making a little ball and pretty soon it gets bigger and bigger and it's the masking fluid that has paint on it. And so when I go to um, remove this, instead of having lots of little, oh yeah, lots of little, you can pull it off over there, um, pieces that are all around my art table, I can just pull it off of this and attach it. And then I, I'm you know, not having little pieces everywhere. And my kids loved the, I have I had a big one, and they would come in when they were younger and play with it a little bit because it bounces, it's rubbery. So um, if you've not used masking fluid before, this is a masking fluid pickup. It's actually a rubber cement pickup is what it's called. And they are usually sold somewhere around the masking fluid, depending on where you buy your mask. And you can lift mask with your fingers. You could also use a piece of masking tape, um, but this just is the quickest way, I find. And then I generally, once I've removed the mask, go around the painting with my hand and just make sure I've got it all. I actually framed a painting once and then was looking at it and realized that there was mask under there. I think I ended up taking it, the frame off and fixing it, but um, okay, so, and it's, it's, sometimes it gets enough paint on it that you just can't tell unless you're actually touching it. Or it's gotten a little sticky and it just doesn't come off as easy. Okay, so now that I have the, um, I think there's just a little bit of paint there that's raised. Now that I have the mask off, then I can start to judge um, how everything's looking because now I've got my lightest light and uh, hopefully I've got a dark in there to judge it by. If, sometimes you may not at that point, you may still be working on areas. And there are some paintings where I will go back and remask some part of it because I have masked a larger area and then I take that off and within that larger shape I may have some other shapes that I need to remask. So um, don't feel like if you have some place that you need to paint over that you can't go back and put mask on an area. So I'm gonna turn this around so you guys can see it. Whoops, back of the photo, <laughs> luckily. So um, it can look rough and hard edged depending on your mask and how it um, came out. So, and also when you make those little dots um, for your sparkles. We think we're making small ones, yeah. <laughs> but they usually end up being big. Um, so depending on how big those little circles are, you may want to go and clean up some of those edges. It's a little harder to do on this smaller um, painting, but um, it's a good practice just to try with a smaller brush. So one of the first things that I want to do though is um, I am going to go and soften a few edges on some of my bigger white shapes because just even if you just soften a few edges here and there that will make the mask feel like it's um, not a weird cutout shape because
because every time I go up to a painting that hasn't had some kind of adjustment made to the mask, it um, does feel, uh, I can tell it's been masked and it does feel off. And sometimes what people will do is just paint um, right over the mask. These don't necessarily need to get painted because they're the white parts of the water. But um, before I will paint over a mast area, I will either clean up the edge or I will soften an edge here or there just so that it feels less cut out. So I'm using that other. I made a nice paper towel there to act as my sponge and then I took it away. <laughs> used it. I, I tend to paint with a sponge at home. I think I told you guys because it just keeps me from soaking my paper towel all the time. Okay, so I'm going to start, um, let me zoom in a little bit here because it's just water. And then we'll move this over. So I'm going to start um, on this one and I am just going to pick a few areas. And this is my flat brush that does not have as much, um, it doesn't have a stiff, as stiff a bristle as one of my scrubbers that I use. So it's going to only lift a certain amount. And I tend to work from the white side toward the color. Because if I go the opposite direction, if I go this way, I'm generally going to push color into that shape. So it depends on what you're trying to do. If you're trying to create um, a shape that has um, some value to it, you can use the color. So if I, like right here, where it comes by this rock, if I wanted this, part of that um, to be a little shadowed, I can actually just wet that area and that pushes some of the color from the rock into my white area. So just be careful depending on which you want, whether you want it to be mostly white or if you want it to have a little bit of color, which direction you're pushing with your brush. Now most of these colors are not staining. If you used phthalo, if you used um, indigo or some kind of a color that is uh, staining, then it might be a little harder to get those edges to soften. Ultramarine, burnt sienna, um, cobalt, uh, the new gamboge, generally those colors are, are not going to um, have an issue waking up the paint. And sometimes the more layers you have in an area, the harder it can be to um, cause the pigment to adjust or soften. All right. So I could go around and soften all those, adjust some edges here and there, and um, it will make it feel like it's um, part of the water. And it gives it kind of that hard and soft edged feel, which is always nice in watercolor as well. And I am going to do just a couple more here and then I'll pass this around so you guys can see the difference between these and up here. And then we'll move on from there. Let me get a little more. And the um, glass painting that I'm doing is um, almost every uh, masked edge has to be adjusted, which was a lot of different pieces. So it can vary depending on uh, what you're doing. Because some, sometimes if you have a masked edge that is uh, exactly, you know, it's a good shape, you don't necessarily need to do this for every one of them. What do you do for the circles that are supposed to be small and aren't as small as you yeah. Okay, that is a good question. So I'm going to go in with a number two. So a small guy. If you can wake up the pigment around that shape, then let me pick one. See if I can zoom in. If you can find um, an area where it's got color around it that you can sort of just wake up that pigment, and it's a little harder to do with a round brush because they uh, have bristles that are uh, not as stiff. Sometimes you can get the pigment to wake up and be dark enough. That, all it's doing really is just making a slightly um, mid value right there. So I'm actually going to go over to my palette and 
hopefully you have some of the color still available. If you don't, I would just try to get as close in value as you can, and I will show you on another one. So I just like totally changed the size of that one. And um, I'll do one more. Let's see, let's change this one because it's big. Now, it depends in water because sometimes you'll get a group um, of water, a group of water. It's a group of water <laughs> that bunches together and creates a big shape. So who's to say that you don't have a larger um, you know, shape that that's you know, not necessarily wrong. However, because most of these back in here are supposed to be sparkles and not big um, areas of white water, then that would be trying to go back in and adjust them. I'm going to get out uh, Ultra, oops, I have Ultra right now. I'll get some more water on it so it'll be ready to use and some new gamboge. And um, then I'm going to hopefully be able to show you, let me see if I can find a light area. Maybe right in there. Okay. So if I have made my color and I think, oh, I've got the perfect mix. This is exactly what I need. And I go in here and it's wrong. See how that's too dark? I don't know if you guys can see from where you're at, but it's too dark for around that shape. Then. Once you've got it on there, taking some clear water, and I usually place the clear water a little bit back from the shape, and then touch into that dark color that I just placed on there, and it helps blur it into the water. So what I'm doing is basically creating a new value around that um, light shape but it won't look like I've created a hard edge or a dark circle around it because I've let it kind of flow into the water that's around that area. So it's a matter of going in and trying to match um, your, your color that you've got on around those white areas and then just either pulling out that color into the surrounding area like that one or using a little bit of water to um, fade it. So sometimes even just like that, I did create a darker value there, but it's okay. It adds to the values in the water. So it's, it's kind of a mix of both, of going back and forth. Now, we could get very, have to be precise and have every one of those be perfect little circles or perfect shapes. But generally, um, just having a few here and there that are uh, the right size or getting rid of the ones that maybe are just too um, strong. Like I've got some shapes in here that I don't really care for uh, the look of them, this one especially. So I'm going to soften some edges on this one and then see if I can get this um, back edge here. I'm going to have to use my stiffer bristle. So this is a fabric flat, Dynasty fabric flat. It's a number two. They have stiffer bristles than a regular flat. And I found these at Miningers. I do not know if they're available online anywhere. They don't um, have them there anymore. At least they did a couple weeks ago. Oh, really? Yep, they were out. I did the last two. Okay. Dynasty what? Uh, Dynasty fabric flat. And this is a two. Um, they have round, uh, one round, and then they have a four, I believe. And for the two, um, it still had too many bristles, so I laid over about half of them and cut the other half off because it was just too um, thick. And they may have more, or maybe there's somewhere else. Yeah, the, the, when I went to Miningers, they were in a container up by the south door on a shelf. They weren't by the regular brushes. They're in an odd spot. spot. Yeah. So I don't know. I asked somebody. They may not have known. May not have known, yeah. Um, yeah, because they used to be by the regular brushes and then they moved them, so. Maybe that's it. Yeah. Yeah, and, and they may be online somewhere. I just have never looked for them online. Um, but I like them. And really, any fabric, or any, not fabric, but any craft brush or maybe, um, you could look at oil brushes or acrylic brushes to see if it has, has a stiffer bristle. Um, and I like the smaller um, flats rather than a wide one because you can't get into some of the small areas with some of those. And so having it be a little smaller is more helpful for me. 
even if it takes me a little longer around some of the bigger shapes. Okay, so I am going to just stop here and I'll pass this around so you can see this and then once it's um, back, I will do just a touch more. Actually, let me do a little bit up here so that, well, no, because I, I want you to see the difference between those. Let me pass this around. I will pause this. All right, so I'm going to soften just a couple edges up in here so that um, I can show you a little bit on this area. And generally, um, I would soften these edges and then use a uh, use the blow dryer to make sure it's dry or just give it some time to dry because it can uh, cause your color to move if it's wet. So I'll do this a little over here. I'm wearing orange on my finger. I seriously wish they would fi finish that construction. <laughs> God. Can I imagine what they're doing? Yeah, I know. How many weeks? Yeah, it's been, this is five. Well, and then who knows if they worked when the snow that caused us not to have a class. They might, might have. I can't imagine they only work days of have a class. I know. Yeah. Okay. Um, all right, so I've got um, areas softened here and there. And even on a couple of these lighter areas that I had painted in when the mask was on there, um, there was one right here that felt really hard edged and it was a, too much of a geometric shape. So I wanted to adjust that one. And I have not adjusted anything here yet, so I'm not going to paint anything there. This area doesn't really need a lot of color on it. Really, if you're moving your mask and softening edges in here, it'll probably pull some of the paint around it because those are smaller shapes. And so it may um, put color in there and that may be all you need in this area. It may not need more. So then for this area, I'm going to use a little bit of water in a couple places because I want to some hard and soft edges. And then I'm going to use the um, ultramarine burnt sienna mix that I already have that's a gray. Um, and I'm using it light kind of pale so if I put some right there it's it's not going to be very dark and but it will be dark enough that it will tone the water I could also put um, yeah it's mostly gray um, so I think I'll stick with that so I'm going to just use a little bit of some water dotted in there and if you want a little bit of green in there you could use some of the green mix and because that water is actually really wet right now that I put on there, I'm going to wait just a few seconds and I'm going to put some water over here. Let's see. Okay. And the water that I'm putting in there, you could not put that in. There's another way to do it. So if I say it's not wet up here, if I put a shape right there, if I decide once that starts to dry that that's a little too hard edged or whatever, if I want to soften an edge, once I've got that shape on there, I could um, come in and use a little bit of water next to it to soften that, that shape, that edge. So you don't have to do what I did with the water first. You could put your, sh your color on and then come back and soften an edge here and there. I'm actually going back into my color and getting just a little more um, ultramarine in the mix because I wanted it a little bluer, maybe not quite as uh, neutral gray as I had it. And then right down in here, this is pretty gray at that edge. And there's some white in here. And just a little bit maybe right over in here. And this is, this is kind of a just guessing in some instances on the shapes that you want to put in and then um, it may be actually seeing a shape that you want to use that's over in your image but um, again it's not necessarily has to be an exact replica of the photo. 
it's more just putting some value in there and leaving some of the white. The other thing that I like to do is, um, in some of the white areas, is just a few little um, dots that look sort of like darker spray. And those are actually a little dark. Okay. So uh, this is going to, this water up here is going to feel um, a little too white. So I'm going to add just a little bit of color up in here along the edge. The sunlight's coming from this direction. So I'm going to put the color on this um, right side of that shape because that's more the shadowed side. And uh, then it will feel like the upper edge is more in, in light. Okay, and I will stop there and um, just let you guys see this and then it would still be uh, going around and, and deciding do I need to change anything. The last thing that I'm going to do is I am going to put a little bit of shadow over this just so you can see it if you want to use it on yours. And I do have a couple whites right here that are hard edged. So I need to go in before I would put the shadow on there and just soften those so that they are not hard edged where everything else is soft on that rock. Okay, so I am going to use my ultramarine and burnt sienna and it is a um, mix that is thicker, not a lot of water in it. And I, I want it kind of on the blue side of that mix because um, shadows tend to be cooler, depends on what they're going over, all of that. Um, and then you could take a few seconds if you want to and draw in some lines, but basically I'm just going to um, kind of make it up as I go. And, and I want it to feel like uh, tree branches are over this rock so it's um, it's uh, kind of you know like a tree branch type of shape and and I'm making them sort of round over the top of the the rock and I don't really see any other place that I need to do that so okay so I'm gonna stop there and then I will turn this around so you guys can see it and I would still have more I would have to finish and there may be actually I'm seeing now where in this white water right here sorry one last thing because I turned my head and saw it there are some places in here that are darker so if you're looking at it and you find uh, places that you didn't leave um, open when you were masking that you want to make darker it doesn't um, hurt to put some of that in because that will make the, the white of the water feel whiter. And it also makes it feel like it's going over that rock. All right, now I will stop. So this one is um, the one I was going to demo um, a little bit of the bottom part of the falls and then I wanted to show you some foliage um, mostly next time. I may start with a little bit of color tonight just so you can see what my thought process is. And um, the photo is, uh, whoop, that's really hard to see, uh, Grizzly Creek um, near Glenwood Springs. And um, it's a, uh, there's a um, car pull-off area there that you can um, stop and when you get out at it, it, the road is on the south side of I-70, and if you park there, or you can park on the other side actually, but you're gonna go under I-70 um, and walk up the trail, so going north on the uh, north side of I-70, and that's, um, we walked up in there and took lots of pictures, and it was beautiful. So. Um, what I started with is a mix of color down in my water. And right now, like I had mentioned last time, this can look really strong, like, oh my gosh, that's gonna be white. But it will make a difference once I get the darker color in the foliage next to it. So the area that I still have to do is some water that's down in here, and there's some water that comes over the edge on this side. And it does vary 
by the side what color I'm seeing. So on the left side in here, um, it looks kind of brown, purple brown, in through here. And then on this side, obviously, it's it looks white, but there's blues and there's some little bit of yellow in places and some grays. So I have out uh, burnt sienna, uh, burnt sienna, cobalt, cerulean, um, my quin gold for just a few places of warm in the water, and then my warm red, the pearl scarlet. And I am going to start um, on the back section over here that is more brown and I think I'm going to use um, my burnt sienna with some uh, cobalt in it for back in there and maybe just a tiny touch of my warm red in it so that there's a little variety and back here um, actually before I do that, I'm seeing some area that's in the sun that's a little warmer, a little more golden. So I'm going to put that in first, and I need to figure out where I'm at. Okay, so right about in here, and then it pretty quickly goes into the burnt sienna, and it will look a little um, intense until it starts to dry, and also until I start to get some of that other in around it and there's some rocks and things that I'm seeing that I am just painting around those are things that you could mask if you wanted to but if I can paint around a shape rather than having to mask it that's generally what I will do because it's a lot easier to um, have it feel a little fresher and not have to go back and mess with the masking fluid if I don't have to. Okay, so there's some bluer places right in here that I masked, and so those are protected, and there's a darker edge right here, and then it goes a little browner. So I am not cleaning my brush again between these. I'm sometimes kind of pushing the paint off on my palette, but it's, uh, oops, it's, um, yeah, it's, it's kind of a dirty brush, basically, because right now it doesn't matter if it's vibrant, it can be a little neutral. I was just listening to myself, and sometimes it's funny how um, I'll hear, it's almost like a question, it can be a little neutral. <laughs> like, no, no, that's a statement. You don't need to make a question there. <laughs> okay, so I've placed the falls there, and then it does get a little bluer. So now I will clean the brush, and I'm going to tone it just a little bit with my warm red. I don't, I don't know, I may have masked in there, so that may not, it's not going to pick it up because it's masked. Yeah, it's masked. There is one area in there that's maybe not. Okay, and then um, this is brown again down in here. So sort of a dirty brush kind of color. And I feel like there's a little blue in that as well. And there's some um, branches, a uh, tree that's right in this corner. I did not mask it, and that would actually be a place that if I was concerned about um, the edge of that shape that you might mask because it's harder sometimes to paint around those edges and make them feel like the uh, foliage that you want to create. And then as I come over here, this may end up being too yellow. I may have to neutralize it a little bit, but I'm going to leave it for now. As I come over toward this side, I'm going a little more purple and I use cobalt and a touch of my warm red for that. And then as I come down toward the front, I actually am seeing a little bit of glow that looks a little orange right in here. And that may be from some of the foliage around it or there may be some 
rocks or something that's down in there. So that actually helps bring in that worm that's up there. And I have masked some of the whites in the water, but I have not masked all of them. So um, that is a way that also you can make it feel a little fresher because uh, then I can kind of pick and choose if I want to keep more white or um, take more white away. Whoops, getting a little messy here. Come on, there we go. I wanted sort of a purpley color right in here. And so that, this purple, when you make it with the warm red and um, cobalt or ultramarine will be a more neutral purple mix. And that's in shadow, so that's why I wanted that to be darker there. And then as I come toward the front area, I'm going to get out the paper towel, I am going to use um, a little bit of clear water to cause me to, or force me to have hard and soft edges. So um, I am just dotting on and maybe brushing in lines so that it will force me to have that variety in there. And then wherever it hits a um, area of water, it's going to pull the paint and create, kind of creates for me so I don't have to create all those shapes because it um, wants to move it. And then I just kind of go with it. And I want just a little bit of that warm. So I'm using the cad red and my um, Quinn gold right down in here. And then if it starts to get hard edged, like right in there, and I didn't want that, I use some water with it. Um, there is cool that is sort of cerulean, so I'm seeing in places it could be cobalt, but I tend to like in some of the more shadowy places to use the cerulean. So. And um, I don't know if you noticed, but wherever it hits the water, it um, grabs it and makes an interesting little shape. And then there is some white in this corner, but I am not going to leave it white on the corner because when you have white in your corners or on your edges, it can pull the viewer's eye and they can either get stuck there or um, it can pull them out of the painting and then, um, you know, that you lose them. So I have got rid of that with a little bit of the cobalt and uh, warm red to create that sort of purple color. Okay, so now I have color all over my falls. I will turn this around so you can see it. It's a little wet, so I can't quite tip it completely up, but um, it's got um, variety and it may still end up needing a little bit of some value in a couple places, but it's interesting because it's got, it's got that variety. So, sorry, I should have shown with the picture um, the first time. Okay. So then for the foliage in the background, um, I would work it up again slowly from light to dark. And But to get myself started, I can start picking out some of these brighter um, trees to give myself a base to start with. So let me clean um, this off just a little bit. And I will probably use Nudium Boge and Oriolan with my cobalt. And I decided to change the trees. Uh, there's trees right here that are some kind of evergreen trunk in here, and I decided to make them aspen. So I have masked those with masking tape, and this one I'm going to make an aspen as well. It's in front of an evergreen. And then these guys will just be the um, probably some kind of an evergreen trunk on there and masking, you say masking tape masking tape just regular masking tape I use the scotch brand um, it's high adhesion and it's number 2020 and you can get it from Home Depot in the paint department 
Um, and it says it on the roll on the inside, it shows that number. And the reason I use it um, is because it is uh, a little stickier than some masking tape. And I like the creamy color of it because you can see my pencil line and I did not have to draw dark to be able to see the pencil line. Okay, so, so that doesn't pull up on the page. No, as long as you're using uh, arches paper, it does just fine with it. Um, whenever you pull masking tape off though, you should pull it at an angle, not straight down because it, uh, depending on the paper, it could tear it. And then I would always test your paper because um, it can, on some papers, it won't do well with the masking tape. Okay. And then, go ahead. New Gamboge and New Gamboge, Oriole and Yellow. And then I have Cobalt out, and I have my Cerulean. I may go back and forth between the two. Um, they, uh, yeah, I'm trying to decide where exactly I want to start. I kind of feel like I want to put some color over here first. And that goes... Um, on this right side, it gets dark pretty quick, so there's just a few highlights in there, and I have masked some of those, but I'm going to go ahead and give it a base coat, and because it is um, a little more, it's not vibrant on this edge over here, I think I will use the cobalt with some new gamboge because that's a, um, a uh, more olivey mix rather than the Oriolan with the um, cobalt because that is a more vibrant mix. And so this is just getting a base layer and I will probably um, shift my colors as I'm going so that there's some variety. So I will put the edges in and I will be sort of scumbling the paint on. I did not pre-wet. You could, but I am just going to go back and forth now between my colors as I'm moving down this shape. So I went into my cerulean to get a, a little bluer there, and now by cleaning my brush and grabbing a little more of the new gamboge, I can make it a little more vibrant. And so having that uh, variety and just touching there, now I've got some variety happening too. I can vary it, and I think I will work on, I will ignore the bush that's right here and go just in this area so you can kind of see what I'm doing without me doing everything. And, oh, I think I'll go around that. Get out a little bit of your bows again. And, oops, keep my hand out of the wet water area. And then, it's really more important on your edges than the middle right now at this stage because um, those edges can make a big difference on if it feels like a tree or a bush or a rock or, you know, to have that variety of an edge in there. Um, I like in some of my foliage to have a bluer area, which is maybe not realistic if you were looking at a actual tree, but having that blue, sometimes that little bit of vibrant pop of blue in there can make it look interesting and it's, you know, makes it feel more artistic. Okay. So I used a little, almost, well it was, straight cerulean there. I'm going to go, I was going to go into the Oriolan, but I think I'll save that for over here and then I will finish. Okay, so and this is basically sort of scumbling. I'm just kind of following my paint as I move it down the page and making sort of random edges. And, oh, come on. Go a little warmer on the edge because it's being hit by some light right in this area. And then this will need to go darker. It will need another layer, but it's um, something to give me a good base coat. And at the bottom there is some uh, uh, land it looks like, some earth. So I will not be going all the way down by the water right now. Just finish up right in here. Okay. That in. And then, um, well, the, the cerulean that I put in is now gone. It got eaten up in there, but that's okay. I can put some more in later. All right, so over here, if I were going to do a, a 
um, bush or tree that's in the sunlight, it's going to be more yellow, um, less of the, the blue in the mix, and where it's really hit, in fact, this tree right here, I don't know if you can see it on the camera, this tree or bush right here is really lit by sunlight, so it's really strong, vibrant, kind of yellowy green right here. And so I'm going to um, put that one in. I will go almost straight um, Oriolan. You could go with a lemon, or I have hands of light in, or hands of medium in my palette, but I don't want it. Um, I don't want it fluorescent yellow. So um, starting with the yellow, but then I'm going to go in and grab some of my cobalt and give it. Whoop, too wet. Give it some green so that it's not just yellow, but it has that uh, in the sunlight kind of glowing type of feel to it, especially once it gets some of the darker values around it. And I'm still using my big brush, and I am up on the tip of it for this, and um, I am leaving some openings here and there. So when you have a very lit object, having some white in there uh, where maybe the sunlight is just really blowing it out and you're not seeing the actual color can um, make it feel even more sunlit. And I need some more yellow along the edge. Should have left a little more yellow down in here, but okay. My yellow is higher on mine than in the photo. And let's see if I can get just a touch more yellow in there. Okay, so. For me, it would be uh, going around and starting to find the lighter pieces, and then some of the foliage will sort of blur together so that it becomes one bigger shape, or, um, you know, like this. All There's probably a tree here, maybe a bush there, and another bush here, but it all just becomes sort of one combo shape. And then I can come in and put some more layer in there and give it some more value. But I'll stop there, and if you guys um, want to work a little longer, you have some more time. And I'll do, I'll try to have a few more um, of my lighter shapes in next time so that I can show you some of the darker values on top of it.